Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Every Book is an Engineering Book, um, Using Literature for Engineering Design Processes um, webinar with Reading is Fundamental um, in partnership with Train Technologies. Um, everyone is muted for this presentation. If you have any questions at all, um, I would like to direct you to submit them through the question box um, in the right hand corner. Um, and also feel free to use the chat function as well. All right, so today we will go over an overview of reading is fundamental. We will discuss um, what is literature-based engineering, why we need it, how it works, and then at the very end, um, everyone will get a chance to test it out. Reading is Fundamental is the nation's leading children's literacy nonprofit. We are committed to a literate America by inspiring a passion for reading among all children, providing quality content to create impact, and engaging communities in the solution to give every child the fundamentals for success. Reading is Fundamental was founded in 1966, um, and throughout our history, we have reached 100 million children in all 50 U.S. states, D.C., and the U.S. territories. We have distributed 422 million books at over 18,000 registered program sites. All of this has been with the help of more than a million volunteers, teachers, and advocates all across the country. Now, I would like to introduce you over to Aaron Bailey, who is our Director of Content and Programs. Aaron is a former classroom teacher, reading specialist, and ESL specialist. Aaron is a doctoral candidate at the George Washington University, where she also serves as an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Thank you, Connor, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, Reading is Fundamental this afternoon to learn about literature-based engineering. This is what I like to call an interactive webinar. So that means every so often, I'll be asking you to join in and give some comments, feedback, share your questions, and we'll be doing that through this website that's called Padlet. Um, so what you can do is scan this QR co code here with your phone, or Connor's going to share the link with you in the chat if you'd prefer to use the link. Um, and then you'll see this page come up that says reflect and redesign. Um, what are your hopes and goals for today? And there's a pink arrow at the bottom and that's how you can add your comment. So you can uh, add your hope and goal for today. You can comment on someone else's. You can also like someone else's. So I'll give you a minute to get that QR code scanned, and then I'm gonna to toggle over and share out some of our hopes and goals for today. It looks like Connor's also put the Padlet link in there. Okay, so let's see what you all are saying. We have gained some strategies, learned something new about uh, STEM, STEAM, and library classes, how to engage families, learn more ways to incorporate literacy into engineering, great.
Ah, mentor text. Yes, everyone's always looking for mentor text. Wonderful. So let me go ahead and I'll create opportunities to hook students into learning about engineering. Wonderful. These are all great hopes and goals. Thank you for participating. Okay, so we'll jump right in to our main question, which is what is literature based engineering? Um, so simply defined literature based engineering students use classroom literature. So books that are already in your classroom library or your school library to identify problems a character faces design solutions and engage in the engineering design process. And I know everyone loves examples, so I have some here for you. I started using uh, literature-based engineering when I was a first grade teacher, classroom uh, teacher. And then uh, I loved it so much, I started training others in how to use it when I became a literacy specialist. So these are three of my favorites from first grade classroom. We had the book On Nuts. Um, in this story, a squirrel is storing nuts uh, all year, but he has a favorite nut and it seems to keep uh, getting away from him. So in this, the problem the character was facing was how to properly store his uh, acorns, his nuts, so that they wouldn't uh, get away from him. And the students designed a solution for that. Uh, the gi gigantic turnip, another great story in this book, uh, a little old woman and an older man um, grew all their vegetables in their garden. And then one turnip that was the last one in there, they were, they, it was so big, they couldn't get it out. And they had all these different animals trying to help pull out the turnip. So the problem there was the gigantic turnip was stuck in the ground. So this, my first grade students designed engineering solutions to help uh, the woman and the man pull that turnip out of the ground. And then this lovely book, Swim, Little Wombat Swim. Uh, this little wombat here makes friends with a platypus and the platypus wants wombat to go swimming. Um, but of course, wombat can't swim and sinks to the bottom. So in this, uh, the students, the problem was that the wombat couldn't swim. So students designed an engineering solution, either a flotation device or some kind of a swimming apparatus to help the wombat swim. Those are just a few examples from my own practice as a first grade teacher. Um, and then of course, why do we need this? We hear about engineering all the time and I'm gonna share some of the engineering standards with you in just a minute. Um, but we're looking for the intersection between uh, math and science and reading comprehension. Um, this type of approach provides students with authentic and context rich opportunities to design engineering solutions for characters. So as I just showed you on the previous slide, we first started by identifying the problem that the characters faced in each of these books, which is typically a reading comprehension skill. Um, but then we designed a solution for it. And that's the engineering piece. Um, the best part about using literature-based engineering is that these authors of these stories did not write these books with the intention of students designing an engineering solution for the characters. So therefore, the authors who are children's books authors had no agenda or biases, and the children are really having an authentic experience to, de to define the problem and design a solution. And then if you choose to have your students work in teams, um, this can promote teamwork and collaboration. So those are all the reasons why I love literature-based engineering. Before using literature-based engineering, I still did engineering uh, projects with my students. It just didn't feel as focused as when I added this uh, component of literature to it. Okay, so how do we connect this to the standards? So let me just tell you, I was very intimidated when the next generation science standards uh, came out. Before the standards came out, common core standards came out and everyone thought that that was um, scary. I actually moved abroad and I remember very clearly getting a text from one of my friends that said, ooh, Aaron, if you thought the common core state standards were hard to navigate, wait till you get back to the US and see the next generation science standards. Uh, they're very difficult. and when you look at this standard right here it's very text heavy so you can see why but what i do love about these standards is that 
each unit finds a way to integrate the engineering process into it. And I'll show you how here. So this is a first grade standard. Um, the standard is from molecules to organisms, structures and processes. So that's a lot of words right away. But really what most teachers do with that unit is they do a plants and animals unit. And they look at the structures of different plants and animals. For example, a, the structure of a bird's beak, wings or claws, and then they talk about um, the function of those uh, body parts or plant parts. Um, so what students are going to do for the engineering component of this standard is right here in the black, um, students who demonstrate an understanding can use materials to design a solution to a human problem by mimicking how plants and or animals use their external parts to help them survive, grow, and meet their needs. And then luckily the NGSS po provided this clarification statement here in the red. It says examples of human problems that can be solved by mimicking plant or animal solutions could include designing clothing or equipment to protect bicyclists by mimicking the turtle's shell um, acorn shells and animal scales, stabilizing structures by mimicking animal tails and roots on plants, or keeping out intruders by mimicking thorns on branches and animal quills, and detecting intruders by mimicking eyes and ears. So all of this, just looking at the structures and functions of different uh, plant and animal body parts, and then designing a solution to a human problem, has a very fancy word. And that fancy word is biomimicry engineering. And you probably think that's a big word. I don't know if first graders can handle it. They absolutely can. More often than not, it's their parents that can't seem to grasp that word. But first graders, uh, once you explain it to them and give them some examples, there's also wonderful books out there on biomimicry and wonderful YouTube videos. They absolutely do grasp it. So I did include an example here to show you. Uh, you can see this little picture here of a burr. Um, and this is a great example of biomimicry because uh, there was a Swiss engineer, um, Georges de Mistral, who went out for a walk with his dog one day. Um, and he noticed that these burrs were sticking to the fur of his dog in the woods. And, and that is how he um, came up with the hook, hook and loop system that later became known as Velcro. Um, Velcro is great for humans to use. We use it to keep on our shoes and all other kinds of things. So this is a really fun and tangible example for students to learn how um, biomimicry works. So back to my um, example, when I used to do this with my first graders, we had the problem in awe nuts, the squirrel needed to uh, create a container to store his nuts, the giant turnip, the little old woman and the old man needed to be able to get that giant turnip out of the ground and swim wombat swim, the wombat needed to uh, be able to swim so he could play with his friend platypus. All of these problems that we identified, students then designed a solution for using models from plant and animal structures. And we had our specific unit was on bird plant, uh, bird body parts. So we did that just to give them a little bit more guidance there, but you can adapt it to any anything that you would like, any unit that you're doing. Um, so here it is, here's the engineering design process. So we first have define the problem. And remember in this approach, we're going to read a storybook and get our problem from the storybook. Then step two, we're going to plan a solution. Three is make a model. Now I'll pause and talk about this for a little bit because making a model uh, or a functional prototype, the standards like to call it, it depends on your time and materials that you have available in your school. So some of you may be able to spend extensive time and having students actually make the model. Some of you, the model may be more like a blueprint, something that they're going to design with a pencil and paper. So you just have to work within the parameters of your school day, the resources that are provided with you. Um, then number four, you're going to test the model. Uh, if you do have a functional prototype, of course, you can test it out, and I'll show you some examples of that later. But if, you were, if you're unable to actually make a functional prototype, you'll have to more 
um, design a test for your model. And then leading to number five, reflect and redesign. Um, think about what worked well with your model and what didn't work well with your model um, and come up with a redesign for it. And of course, because it's a process, we know that, that it's not linear, it's uh, circular. So it goes right back to defining the problem because if you test out your prototype and something doesn't work, you now have another problem. What doesn't work with my prototype and why doesn't it work? So we're going right back to defining the problem, planning the solution and, and fixing up our model. Okay, so how does this all work? Step one, you are going to read a book and identify problems that the characters face. And we're going to do that together in a moment because remember, this is an interactive webinar. Uh, step two, you will select one problem and consider the character's needs and the context of the story as you brainstorm solutions. So this is something you can do uh, individually or you can do it as a class on chart paper. Uh, for me, I preferred to have students brainstorm as many questions as they could, and we would write them together on chart paper, but then we would just circle one question that we were going to solve uh, together and we'd break up into teams to solve that problem. I found, I've done it both ways, but especially with younger students, I found if all uh, groups in the class are working on one problem together, um, it it allows them to have a little bit more clarity in what they're doing and it helps you as the teacher be a little bit more organized. But certainly you can come up with many problems for the same book and each group can be working on a different problem. Um, step three, you're gonna either have your students work individually or in teams to plan and build a functional prototype that addresses the character's needs. Now, a reminder to you, some of you may not have uh, the time or space in your school day to do a functional prototype, but if you're able to, that's great. Step four, you're gonna test the model, and step five, reflect and redesign. Okay. Here's another example of a literature-based engineering project that I did, again, when I was teaching first grade, and this is the book Lost and Found. So in this book, uh, a penguin shows up at a little boy's doorstep and the boy, the penguin can't speak, can't communicate with the boy. So what happens is the boy assumes that the penguin must be lost and he returns the penguin home to the South Pole. Well, it turns out that the penguin was not lost. He was just lonely, wanted a friend. So here's the standards that I align this with. This is in the unit on waves, light waves and sound waves and their applications to technology. You can see here the engineering standard says, use tools and materials to design and build a device that uses light or sound to solve the problem of communicating over a distance. And they have again a clarification statement that says, examples of devices could include a light source to send signals, paper cup and string telephones, and a pattern of drum beats. And they also provided an assessment boundary. The assessment does not include technological details of how the communication device works. So again, if you are not able to create a functional prototype, they've given you that ass assessment boundary there that you can just do a blueprint and explain how your device would work. So how does this work with our problem of the penguin? Well, we see that the penguin could not communicate and this standard is solving the problem of communicating over, the dis over a distance using light or sound. So what our students ended up doing was creating some kind of a, a device, and they all did different devices, but I've provided this concrete example for you here so that you can practice it. Uh, what they did, you can see we used household materials. We had a water bottle, filled it up with either rice, beans, or macaronis, uh, taped the top shut, and then we had a sound device here. So uh, you could practice it by using these adorable penguin masks here. And one shake could mean yes, two shakes could be no. You could have your students try it out and practice it and think about how communication could have made a difference in the story. The boy could have asked, are you lost? 
and the penguin could have done two shakes to say no, and then the boy could have asked, are you lonely? And the penguin could have done two shakes to say yes. So again, your students are going to design their own solution, but we've provided this concrete example just to highlight the ways that this can be applied. And another thing that we've provided for you is um, this template about the engineering design process. Oops. Um, so you can see all those parts in the process are right here. You can write the title of the, you have your students write the title of the book, jot down some of the problems from the story and how we can solve those problems. And then there's an area here to design your blueprint with labels and write out what materials you'll need and then try it out and write out your reflection and redesign. This, these spaces on this template may be too small if you work with younger students. So you may just want to enlarge it and create a packet having one page for each of these. Those are options for you. Okay, so like I said, it's an interactive, we're going to practice this. So I am now going to um, change my screen to face on me and I'll be reading this book, Benji, the Bad Day and Me by Sally J. Pla and illustrated by Ken Min. Uh, this book was donated as a read aloud by Liam Lowe. Thank you very much, Liam Lowe, for allowing us to read this book as part of the webinar. Um, in this book, uh, there's a boy named Sammy, and he's not having such a great day at school. A lot of things aren't going the way he would like them to go. He comes home and his younger brother named Benji, who has autism, is also having a bad day. And we'll find out how they solve that problem together. So what I would like for you to do as the audience, as I read aloud this book, think about what problems, or jot down if you have a pen and paper, what problems the character are facing in the story. Write down as many problems as you can. So give me just a minute here as I switch over the screen. Okay. I'm trying to make sure you can see. Connor, I'm getting a message that they can see me, but I can't see myself. Okay, great. I'm gonna do my best. I cannot see myself right now. So I will read it and I'll probably hold it up so you can see the picture afterwards. But here we go, Benji, the bad day and me. Remember, as I'm reading, you're writing down all the problems that the character faces in this book. At recess, I got yelled at for kicking the fence. At lunch, they ran out of my favorite pizza, so I didn't eat. And on the bus home, the driver missed my sock, so I had to walk all the way back in the rain. Now I'm hungry, cold, and wet. Grr. Shh, says Mama as soon as I open the door. Benji's playing in his box. When Benji's in his box, it's because he's had a bad day at preschool. When Benji's had a bad day, we tiptoe and speak softly. When I've had a bad day, no one tiptoes or speaks softly. Benji, Mama, and I made that box last summer. Mama cut the window flaps and Benji and I splashed on the paint inside. It's cozy and safe, but only big enough for Benji and his blue blanket. I sure wish I had a box for days like this. Benji wiggles his fingers at me. Hi, Benji, I say softly. 
Benji's face appears. Wet Sammy, Benji says. Samuel, says Mama, there's water all over the floor. Take your shoes off this instant. It's not my fault I had to walk all the way in the rain. Benji's block city is spread all around. Watch your step, Mama says. Benji's been working hard on that. I know, I helped, I started to say, but Mama's phone rings and she turns away. I stick my tongue out at the box. I do my best karate kick in the air above Benji's block city. Kacha! I've always wanted to learn karate. Mama says I can't right now because the classes are on Tuesdays and that's when we have to visit the super happy lady at Benji's clinic downtown. Let's bounce the ball, super happy lady likes to say, but Benji never does. Let's play a game, but Benji never plays. Meanwhile, I'm told to sit in the waiting room and not bother anyone. On super happy lady days, we always get back home tired. So mama will make berry smoothies to help us feel better. Then she'll wrap Benji tight in his big blue blanket, just how he likes, and tell him, you're my little burrito. But today, there are no berry smoothies and no burritos. Today, Mama is busy and Benji is hiding. This day is just plain old rotten. Thump goes the box. It's Benji kicking around in there. Hey, I say. Come out and I'll teach you karate. But he doesn't. So I go to the kitchen and pour some cereal, but when I add the milk, too much gushes out. I am grumpy, hungry, and cold, and now there is milk everywhere. I have had it with this fence kicking, rain dripping, milk spilling day. I cry mad, sad, shivery tears. No one notices. And see Benji in his box looking out. Kathunk! Benji's coming out. He holds his blanket up high and tiptoes through the block city. Benji spreads his blanket flat on the floor. What's he doing? He pulls me down on the fuzzy blueness and makes me lie straight and still. Then he rolls me over and over. He works hard to wrap me up tight. Benji leans over me. His forehead clunks my forehead. His eyes look right in my eyes. You're my little burrito, he says. I open the blanket and let Benji in. You're my little brother, I say. And that's how mama finds us. Can I come in too, she asks. Whether the day is good or bad, Benji and I will be okay. That's because the two of us are brothers. Side by side, we where we are now and how we'll always be. The end. Okay, so give me a moment here. I'm going to switch it back so you can see my screen. I hope you were writing down your questions as we were, as I was reading there. And here we go. Here's the next QR code. And the Padlet link is in the chat if you prefer to use the link. Please take a couple moments to share some of the problems that you saw as I was reading aloud that story.
cold, wet, and hungry, caught in the rain, cold and wet. No special place for Samuel to play. Yes, no pizza, that was a big problem. Feels alone and left out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some discussion around exclusion and how to include the brothers together. Mm, yes, he's bored when they go to the clinic to work with the super happy lady. And he also wants to do karate for that time. So as you can see, there are tons of problems just from this very one book that the characters face and that we can start to engineer a design for. So let me back over to the PowerPoint. Um, so we're gonna pick one problem. For this one, I'm gonna say the parameters. The problem I would recommend is that he comes home and he's he's wet so students can work on an engineering design of one that's never been done before of um, how to keep it so that he's not wet on his walk home. And then you're gonna go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry, it keeps clicking back over there, um, plan your solution. So this is the part where you get to draw a little bit. Uh, here are the materials. If we were doing this in person, I would actually bring these materials in. So we would have in front of us tape, paper clips, popsicle sticks, cupcake wrappers, toothpicks, index cards, and pipe cleaners. So what I'd like to do is pre for you to imagine that you have those materials available for you. The problem that we're working on is that Ben, uh, excuse me, Samuel gets wet on the on the way home from school. That was the very first problem in the book. And you are going to engineer, design a solution, how to keep him dry on the way home. Or if you would rather, he's already wet, how can we get him dry? Um, something new and creative outside of what already exists. If you want to use an animal adaptation for that, you certainly may, but that's not the parameters for this specific one. Um, but again, you have these materials available for you. Go ahead and sketch your solution. And then when you have your sketch ready, uh, you can actually use that QR code and take a picture of your sketch with your phone. And I'd love to see some of your blueprints or your designs. Again, because we're doing this virtually, we don't have the luxury of actually creating it. But if we did this in person, I would bring these materials and have you create your own a little functional prototype. So please take a few moments to sketch out your design. Oh, we have a really great question. Um, what keeps the kids from getting stuck on umbrellas or other known things to solve the problem? That's an excellent question. Um, so here's where it takes a little bit of creativity and to say to the kids, we're thinking outside of what already exists to design a new solution. Um, and while you're doing your sketch, I'm gonna talk a little bit about materials. Uh, so you can see I provided here for you a limited amount of materials, uh, a limited type of materials. And there's different theories around giving materials to kids. Some theories suggest that kids should have um, an abundance of materials available to them, uh, limitless options for materials. Um, but other theories of creativity suggest that when children are given less materials, less options of materials, they're forced to think creatively within those materials that they have. Um, so for me, I like to give uh, 
as many materials as usually on here, but limiting that to really cause them to think creatively with the materials that they have. Um, and again, reinforcing to them that we're not inventing a same device like an umbrella, but something new with the materials we have available. Um, another comment I'll make around materials, and this comes out of the book, Connecting Science and Engineering Education Practices in Meaningful Ways. Um, some of the authors talk about what they call material literacy, or how well do you know the materials? And they break it down into three components. Um, one is that the materials need to be knowable. They describe that as knowing how to use the materials. So I know how to use tape. Um, I can bend and twist paper clips. Cupcake wrappers I can rip and tear. These are all skills that I already know how to do with these materials. Um, the second principle is that the materials are humble. That means that I can describe them. So in this, we're not using complex materials like a circuit board or really fancy things. Um, we're using something I can describe like tape. It's a material that's sticky on one side and smooth on another. Um, toothpicks, they're little wooden uh, materials that have points on either side. And the third principle is that it's gettable, uh, or another way of thinking about that is children have access to it. I love to, um, I love to have students bring in their own materials from home. Also, when I taught first grade, students would oftentimes make posters or signs to hang up in the hallways to let other kids in other classes or families know the types of materials that they were looking for. And then we would just stare, uh, store them in what we called an art cart outside of the classroom. So kids were always uh, suggesting what materials they'd like other students and families to donate and we would keep them all together. I see another great question, what is the book again? The book is called Connecting Science and engineering education practices in meaningful ways. I'll go ahead and type that in the chat for you. And that book's a great resource to learn more about literature-based engineering as well. Okay, so hopefully you've had some time to sketch out your design. I'll toggle back over to the Padlet where we have our plan, the solution. Oh, I love it. We have a cupcake liner hat. Ah, index cards laminated with the tape and we're gonna hold them up with pipe cleaners. It's a rain shield mimicking animal scales. Yes, love it. I see a cardboard hat, yep. And I love the way some of you included labels in it as well, where you actually said where the materials were and what they were doing. That's a great practice for students to do as well when they're doing their blueprints. All right, I'm gonna move back over to mine. If you have access to these Padlet li links, so please, if you have time, share it. We'd love to see your designs afterwards. Please share them. Um, I talked about uh, going back to the beginning and I shared those three books with you and my first grade students, and we did make functional prototypes. So here we are testing out our models. On the far left here, uh, you can see a little girl who's designed a flotation device for her wombat, um, I believe using popsicle sticks and pipe cleaners perhaps. And she's testing it out in this little tank of water that we brought in to test out the prototypes. Um, and then the two in the middle and on the right, they were both addressing the problem of getting the giant turnip stuck in the ground. I brought in a, a, a potato and, and buried it in some soil here. And you can see they have their um, devices here that they're using to get the potato out of the soil. So um, the boy in the middle is working with some craft or toilet paper tubes, spoons, um, 
this one I, I remember we were learning about birds and biomimicry. So the spoons are after a, a spoon a spoonbill bird. And then the little girl on the right over here has some uh, two, some excuse me popsicle sticks and tape here, um, mimicking some other kind of bird bird beak to try to grab that potato out of. So very fun ways to practice. And of course, reflect and redesign. So uh, in the handout that we've provided for you, we have a sample or suggested rubric uh, that breaks it down by the standard or skill. So we have here define on the left, define the problem, plan solution, build a prototype and test it, reflect and redesign. And we used some engineering words here. We have novice, apprentice, professional, and expert. It's up to you to build this rubric out with your students. I'm a huge proponent of building your rubric with your students. I think it really embeds in them what is expected of them. So you may just ask them as you're going through it, what would it look like for an, a novice who was de divining a problem for the first time versus someone who's an apprentice, professional, or an expert. And just write some things out together of those defining features. That way students can reflect as they're looking at their own design and uh, trying to see where do they fall on that, on that rubric. So you are going to do the last Padlet here um, for your reflection and redesign. So again, you can either use the QR code or Connor has put the Padlet link in the chat. And these are three questions that I always use with students as a reflection. Um, I used to have these three questions posted up on my wall when I was a reading specialist and students would pick one or all three to answer uh, after their meetings with me. So they are, what did you learn? What skills did you improve? How has your thinking changed? And this is a great way to differentiate uh, your reflection because what we never want is for to ask a student, what did you learn today? Nothing, I already knew it all. So this challenges them to think a little bit deeper. So if you already knew everything that we went over today, then what skills did you improve? Or how did you think about it in a new way? So go ahead and take a couple of minutes to do your reflection. Pop over to the Padlet. That every book is an engineering book, wonderful. So easy to uh, drive deeper engagement around any book. I never considered thinking about looking for problems to solve in a book. This is a great way to engage the listener as there are multiple issues that might need to be solved in a story. Yes, absolutely, and we saw that when, when you all wrote out your problems, there were so many, it was hard to choose just one. Yeah, a comment, can't wait to start using uh, literature-based problems. We're primarily using real world problems. Kids and teachers will love this process. Yes, um, to comment on that, I used to use, that's what I used as well, real world problems before I got into literature-based engineering. and. Actually, that unit, we would walk around the school and try to find problems in the school that we could then design an engineering uh, solution around. Um, however, when I found this, this way of doing it, literature-based engineering, I just found a deeper connection and it was a great way to integrate read-alouds that I was using and tie to some of those comprehension skills as well. Yes, this must be a librarian. Excited to add tags to the books in the library to help teachers quickly find mentor texts. Yes. Oh, another great idea. You can integrate uh, wordless picture books or picture books with, with no text. Yes, that definitely requires uh, careful looking at the pictures to define the problem. Wonderful. OK, 
Okay, well, thank you so much. Here are the references. I'll leave them up for just a moment in case you want to um, use your phone to take a picture to get some of these articles or books. As I mentioned, um, Connecting Science and Engineering Education Practices in Meaningful Ways was one of the books that I was drawing from uh, this afternoon. Okay, and we'll turn it over to questions and answers. If anybody has any questions or anything else that is remaining, um, I'd like to direct you to the question box in the top right corner um, in your go-to webinar panel. We'll get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. Um, but of course, um, right after this, we'll put up the um, email information uh, for any other questions that come up um, or anything else that we can help with. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions about the recording being available or sharing the presentation. Um, so yes, tomorrow, um, for anybody who is registered, we will send out a link to a recording of the presentation along with every single thing that was mentioned um, in this webinar and a copy of the presentation. Um, you are more than welcome to share that out um, with anybody else who might be interested in them. And a couple of things I'll just add to that. All of this uh, webinar today was brought to you by Train Technologies and we do have a brand new center that's called Sustainable Futures on RIF.org. And there are lots and lots of resources for science, engineering, and sustainability through that center, as well as all of the documents that we shared with you today, the handouts that we shared, such as the uh, educator guide, the student guide that includes the rubric, and the penguin example. Um, and in, in addition to that, the book that I read today, Benji, The Bad Day and Me, has lots of vocabulary resources available and a discussion guide that you can use if you choose to read this book with your students, and that's on Literacy Central. Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, we just again want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, it was wonderful to kind of go through this and to hear all of your incredible ideas. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so on the screen is the contact information for the programs team. Um, so please feel free to send us an email at literacynetwork at rif.org. If you have any questions or if there's anything else um, that we can do for you. Um, like I said, we'll send out a copy of this webinar and the presentation um, and all of the other resources that were shared um, tomorrow. So please be on the lookout for that. Thanks everyone. Thank you.